Everybody, we're going to get started, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar today. I'm Judy Browse, the Executive Director of the North American Association for Environmental Education, and really excited that all of you could join us today because our, our presenter is going to talk all about hope, and I think we could use a little hope these days. Um, we're very lucky to have Ellen Kelsey with us today to talk about wild, contagious hope. What a great name for a webinar. I also want to thank our affiliate co-hosts um, for helping to support this webinar series and for all the great work that they're doing to advance environmental education and um, civic engagement. Um, as many of you know, we are all about using environmental education to create a more sustainable future. And these webinars are a way to do that. And I also want to thank Kristen Kunkel, who is our environmental education specialist and who has done so much to bring um, these webinars to life. So Kristen, thank you. And Kristen will be wrapping things up at the end. So as many of you know, um, who have been on past webinars, we try to do these on the fourth Tuesday of every month, but it depends on so many things, including last week we had um, an East Coast um, internet um, die out. So we had to postpone it for this week. Um, but we do try to bring interesting speakers, new ideas, new thinking um, to all of our work so that we can all keep learning and improving our practice and improving the quality of the field. Um, our next webinar is actually right around the corner. It's on May 9th at 4 p.m. And this is introducing our new guidelines for excellence on community engagement. So I hope you all can join us for that as well. Um, so what we'd like to do today, like on our previous webinars, is start with a quick intro to Zoom, which is our platform, and then Ellen will do her presentation, um, and we'll be talking about um, um, Wild Contagious Hope, and we'll also be posting questions throughout on the chat function, so be on the lookout for that. We'll have some questions and discussion at the end, and then a few closing thoughts. So if you've never used Zoom, and I know many of you have been on webinars, because all the phones are muted, we have so many people, it's the best way to share questions, to have a discussion, just go to the chat function and type in your question. You can send questions to me and Kristen, and we'll be monitoring those for Ellen, or you can send them to everybody so everybody can see what you're thinking. And it's a great way to have engagement while we're um, uh, have the phones muted and we're on a webinar. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. I'm so excited to have Ellen here with us today. She is a leading spokesperson for hope and the environment. In 2014, she co-founded a social media campaign devoted to sharing ocean conservation successes called Ocean Optimism, and it's reached more than 74 million users in just two years. She's been awarded prestigious fellowships, including a Rockefeller Fellowship and a Rachel Carson Center for Environment and Society Fellowship to explore the questions of hope in the environment in interdisciplinary think tanks devoted to world changing ideas. She has been dubbed the High Priestess of Hope by the Green Interview and the World Conservation Union featured Ellen and her work in, on hope in their Inspiring People campaign. She also spoke recently at the Earth Optimism Summit on Earth Day in 2017 here in DC, the same day that we had a big march for science here in DC. Ellen has a track record of inspiring change. She wrote the scientific brief for Pew Global Oceans that led former President George Bush to dedicate one of the world's largest marine reserves, the Mariana Trench National Monument. She has led public participation initiatives in marine reserves in Britain, Australia, Canada, the UK, and the US, works with the Monterey Bay Aquarium and a coalition of more than 40 aquariums and visitor centers across the country on a multi-year empowerment evaluation of how we can better communicate about climate change and its effect on oceans. And she recently led the development of a, suit, suit, uh, excuse me, a new social media program for the Monterey Bay Aquarium that invited teens to use their online skills to communicate ocean conservation through a range of social networking platforms. She's the author of many books. She's appeared in many, many magazines. She's won many, many awards. She has a PhD in science communication and international environmental policy. And she works as an external consultant with Dr. Nicole Ardwin, who many of you know 
at Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment. So let's give Ellen a warm virtual welcome. And Ellen, you can take over the screen. Thank you so much. All right. Here we are. Thank you, Judy. What a lovely introduction. And thank you so many of you for taking time out of what I know is always a, a busy life to join a seminar like this. It's a wonderful thing. So I think I'll just jump right in um, with this question of hope and this question of how do we engender hope? You know, it's all of us who are working in environmental educations and communications, how, how do we do that? And this is just a shot of a good friend of mine, Lucinda, who's turned seven recently. And, and at this moment, as she's looking at you in the screen, she is a wolf. And I think that that childlike um, enthusiasm for, for recognizing our part within nature just exists within children. And, and how do we both hold it and keep it as people like Lucinda get older? And I know many of you are working with adults. Many of you are working with little children. Many of you are working with people of all different ages. It's a good question, I think, because what we do know from a number of social sciences studies is that there is a global rise of cynicism and pessimism. And I think this feeling, as, it, as you know, evidenced here by this image, the American Psychological Association recently came out in 2016 with a, a paper looking at this global rise and its implications. We also see a great variety in the way in which we trust others. So there's a, a great program out of Oxford University called The World in Data. And this is one of their uh, pieces of research. And you can have a look there and see how much do we trust other people. So this question of hope and the environment, I think is particularly challenging because our two main sources of, of getting information about the environment are scientific journals and the mainstream media. And in both cases, the emphasis is on problems, problem analysis. And so when you put all of that together, what we end up with is a narrative of doom and gloom about the environment. And my work has been really looking at what are the implications of that narrative of doom and gloom? And then what do we do about that in order to shift the way we talk about the environment in more hopeful ways? I started by compiling um, really growing evidence of, of this hopeless feeling that many people feel about the state of the environment. And if you take a look at just some of those terms, you'll notice that some of them are quite recent. You know, we start talking about things like environmental apathy, environmental depression, Ecophobia is one of the first ones we heard from David Sobel back in 96, but now more work recently in terms of thinking about hopelessness, um, not just ourselves having a difficulty with the environment directly, but sometimes as secondary trauma, recognizing the impact on other species or other people. We also recognize hopelessness among scientists. And this has been a conversation that really sort of jumped into the fore in 2010 and is growing in its um, the number of people talking about it. What do we do about the fact that many conservation scientists feel hopeless about the environment? And I think when as environmental educators, unlike hospice and other professionals where we talk about burnout and the emotional toll of these issues, we really don't talk about that in our own profession. And I think we really need to. It leads me to wonder, is EE a high risk pr uh, profession? When you think about we're dealing with major global issues that touch us directly, um, but we don't have a self-care culture around environmental education. This headline in The Guardian, I think, captures this feeling, is hope the most endangered species in conservation? So my first question I'd, I'd love to do, and I know there's another one running down the chat, but how much does the issue of hopelessness affect your work as an environmental educator? I contend that emotions really matter. And we know things such as in terror management theory, um, these are ideas coming out of conservation psychology, but terror management theory says, you know, if someone's being cynical, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're being apathetic because they don't know there's a problem. Terror management theory says, what if they really know there's a problem and they just can't imagine there's a solution? And if what we do in the case of continuing to tell people about environmental issues uh, without providing if, if we see that they're not engaged and we think, ah, they just don't get it, so we tell them more problems, one of the things that happens is that they tune out or they shut down, or in fact, 
they hyper consume. That consumerism as a self-medication device is something that we see in terror management theory. And it's, of course, not where we want to head as environmental educators. So this, this idea that we need to think through in our zeal to let people know that there are massive environmental issues, um, we really need to be taking into account the emotional toll. We also know from more recent work in neuroscience that when people are afraid, that when you really feel fearful, it tends to speed up our thinking and shut down our tendency to work collaboratively with others. And I would contend that most environmental issues need the opposite. They need us to slow down, be way more creative, and to really work in partnership. It's pretty exciting time to think about emotions because if you look here, this is a graph of just the amount of, of research papers that are coming out in the idea of emotions and decision making. And look at that rise many, many more papers, much more information now about how do emotions affect us. And work by Lerner and others says that emotions essentially drive most of the meaningful decisions we make in life. So our work as environmental educators is to engage people with the planet and the issues facing it. Emotions, I would argue, really need to be at the top of our minds. There's also work coming out of the social and emotional learning groups, which talk about the fact that hope can be taught. And I was really curious as how you teach hope in your environmental education practice. So again, if you wouldn't mind adding into the chat, you know, how do, how do you actively teach hope in the work that you're doing? And I thought what I would do is share some of, some of what I think are important um, considerations when we think about teaching hope. So one is um, to really cultivate compassion and relationship. I would argue that a lot of our work, and certainly in the early days of the environmental movement, was around sounding the alarm. And as part of that, I think we, we kind of created a legacy of fear and shame. You know, you may not be doing enough, and if you don't act quick enough, this terrible thing will happen. But research coming out of groups like the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research at Stanford University talks about compassion as being very important way of motivating and engaging people and this sense of relationship. Some quite recent work just done in 2016 even looks at this not just at the level of psychology but the level of our genes. So if you think about well-being, you know, what, what makes us feel great? There are hedonic things, so this guy on the left reminds me of me because I'm a huge chocolate eater. Um, if you think about hedonic approaches to well-being. It's when you do something that just feels good to you. You take yourself to the spa, you have chocolate cake. Psychologically, it makes you feel better. Eudaimonic well-being is when you do something for the greater good. So you might um, volunteer for a, a, a beach cleanup, like I'm sure many of you did on Earth Day or other activities like that, or you might you know, extend to the members of your community. Eudaimonic well-being and head hedonic well-being psychologically feel the same to us. They both make us feel good. But what this interesting work coming out of both the Sea Care program at Stanford and the School of Medicine at UCLA is that when you do eudaimonic activities, they actually have an impact on our gene expression in terms of improving our health. And so when we let people know that, that when they're involved in a conservation action for the greater good, it not only makes them feel good, it actually improves their, their health and well-being. I think that's a really interesting insight to share. Um, a lot of our work in environmental education historically has focused on us as individuals, what you should do, what I can do, 300 things I can do in my home. But what we see more and more is this extension of an us way of thinking, a co-creation approach, welcoming others into things is far more effective, both in terms of the scale of issues we're dealing with and back to that importance of compassion and relationship. So the more we can focus on a broader we, the more effective I think we are in, in creating hope and engagement. I saw this very much in the work that um, Judy touched on with uh, work that teens at the Monterey Bay Aquarium were doing. What we asked them to do was to take the aquarium's brand and make it their own in order to engage other teens in um, ocean conservation issues. And they've gone ahead and done that, and you can follow them. If you just look up MBA Aquarium Teens, you can see some of their Instagram posts and their Facebook posts right there on the screen. What interested me about this is that one of the campaigns they took on, and they just did this in the last year, was the issue of ocean plastics. 
But instead of showing an image like this, which I know many, many of us have used in conservation campaigns and which I see constantly at science fairs, they wanted to talk more about this, the global rise of the plastic bag ban. They wanted to focus on the fact that there were solutions that were happening all over the planet instead of focusing on the problems that were happening. Um, they intuitively knew something that this research from 2013 shows, which is good news travels faster than bad in social media. They also knew that social media is social. And so if you look at the um, pyramid on the left, they made a content pyramid of how much they would talk about whichever issues. And you can see that most frequently they were posting things about, you know, things that you could empathize with, uh, jokes, uh, dad jokes, that, that sort of thing. Thumb stalking, stopping content as they called it. And only rarely, seldom, did they make a direct conservation ask. And when they did, it had a big impact. And so they recognized that in social ways, you're connecting on positive things, and then you make your ask randomly or, or, or once in a while, and it has a bigger impact. And as many of you will know, they, they and many of us were successful in having the, the plastic bag ban be um, passed in California. So I, I really think this unleashing the power of social networks is also a huge part of spreading hope. And as uh, Judy kindly mentioned, back in 20, 13, I met with just this small group of people here. Some of you will recognize Nancy Knowlton in the middle, who is the um, Saint Chair of Marine Sciences at the Smithsonian and who has gone on to spearhead the Earth Optimism Summit, which just happened on Earth Day. Um, and there's Heather Coldway on the far left with the Chagos Expedition Church. She's the global head of um, marine programs for the Zoological Society of London. And then a number of people who got together who were enthusiasts in conservation and in communication. We just went to a little tiny place in England. We gave ourselves 48 hours and we decided what kind of social change project could we create that would help shift this narrative beyond doom and gloom. And we ended up um, thinking a lot about that because of people I'd met at different places who were using social networks. In this image, I don't know how many of you will recognize it, but this is an image just of the amount of Twitter traffic going on at, at that time, it was 2014, um, and the color differences are language differences. So you can see, it, we, can, we can really see a map of the world through the number of tweets going on in, in languages that are emblematic of those places. So we decided in that 48 hours to launch a Twitter campaign. We called it hashtag ocean optimism, and since that point, 74 million users have joined it. And what's been so exciting to me about that is that one of the big dilemmas I think around hope is that because, it's, because the scientific literature we see mostly talks about problem analysis and the mainstream media mostly publishes problems in the environment, it's really hard to find content that is hopeful. But I knew from years of asking scientists all over the world that there was lots of hopeful content. The problem was just accessing it. And what this Twitter campaign has done is, as you can see from just these few examples, many different organizations are now bringing in their hopeful stories and putting them forward. And what has been exciting to me is that Twitter is well used by the scientific community. And so um, we have a lot of scientists uh, essentially crowdsourcing hope and putting it forward. What we didn't know when we started that campaign is something that came out of a massive study of 750,000 Facebook users in 2014, and that is that emotions are contagious not only in face-to-face, -face, but online. And so again, when we're sharing content about the environment and we want to create more hopeful engagement, recognizing that hope is contagious is important. As I said, optimism is spreading really fast. Um, Nancy spearheaded this amazing summit and if you want to take a look at the Earth Optimism Summit, they have fantastic um, still streaming of, of presentations that were done uh, just last week. Uh, Heather went on and, and started a Conservation Optimism Summit that was held at the Zoological Society of London and at Oxford and Cambridge Universities. And what I've also been thrilled to see is the emergence of other hashtags. There's hashtag Earth Optimism, there's hashtag Conservation Optimism, and all of those have shifted into other platforms. So if you prefer to use Instagram or Facebook, um, you can look for hashtag, or you can look for ocean optimism, conservation optimism, or earth optimism, or many others there to get that kind of content. And of course, that jumps into the mainstream media. And these are just headlines I picked up in the last week as a result of the Earth Optimism Summits. 
My point is that stories change. And I think this is super important to us as in educators. Um, we used a lot of generalized slogans in the past when we wanted to engage people with the issue of whales or we wanted to let people know the problems of the ocean. But I would argue that generalized slogans are not our friends and that what we want to do is focus on specific contexts and emerging trends, which is why that content matters. So I'll just give you a few examples. California blue whales have bounced back to near historic numbers. Monterey Bay, where I've been lucky enough to live, is healthier than it was 200 years ago. San Francisco Bay is now healthier than it has been in the last 50 years. The pollution levels in Los Angeles have dropped, making children's lungs significantly healthier. 85% um, of threatened or endangered bird populations that have been protected under the Endangered Species Act have either increased or stabilized. Those rebounding whale populations that we're seeing in many parts of the world also have a tremendously positive impact on the broader ecosystem. Um, my work in marine protected areas uh, has it's been phenomenal. In a way, we're in, it's not an arms race, it's a marine protected areas race. Uh, the amount of protected ocean has doubled in just the last couple of years. And I'm happy to say that the work that I did uh, where um, President Bush had dedicated the Marianas Trench as the world's largest marine protected area back in 2009, I think it's now the 12th largest marine protected area. Incredible. And we know that in those marine reserves, um, biomass has boosted an average of 400%. We're living in this age of personalization and engagement and specificity. And I think as educators, that really matters to us because we have now the capacity to show kids that, it, or the adults we work with, that conservation issues aren't just stuck. They change, they evolve, things improve, um, different people become involved. And, and one that I like to use is the case of sustainable seafood. And in this case, we can see here direct use between fishers and hackathon people who figure out better ways for fishers to be able to share what they are doing with fish and then how that gets to our plate when we're making a choice in the restaurant has had a tremendous impact on the sustainable seafood market, which in just a decade has grown to be, you know, 14% of the global market. I'm very curious to know where you find hopeful science-based content to share with your students. And if you would be kind enough to throw some of your sources into the chat box, I, the more we know how to get a hold of these stories, the better it is and the more easy it is for us to share them with the people we care about. I think one of the other things to emphasize is that we aren't the only species actively responding. So we have interesting cases of an endangered butterfly that changed its whole diet and habitat. Um, we have humpback whales who we know are tremendous social networkers. And the recovery of humpback whales in the Pacific Northwest, my, my good friend and colleague, Fred Sharp, who is the whale researcher who first discovered that humpback whales use collective bubble net tools, he told me that their return um, was far greater than scientists had estimated in their modeling. And he believes it's because they're such effective social networkers, they let each other know which hunting techniques work well, how to cross busy shipping lanes, what to deal with noise problems in a way that, that shows their active agency. Uh, some work just out of the Monterey Bay Aquarium, we've known for a while, of course, that sea otters recover kelp for us. But in fact, sea otters also have, are now known to recover wetlands. And sea otters in Elkhorn Slough, just north of uh, Monterey Bay, by eating um, some of the predatory uh, sna snails, have actually created the circumstance where feeders that are able to clear off the eelgrass from algae, getting the algae off the eelgrass, allows that eelgrass to flourish and the nurseries to flourish for fishes underneath them. So we're seeing the active capacity of sea otters to recover areas, not just in the marine environment, but in the nearshore environment too. We know that young gorillas have learned how to disable snares by watching rangers and then teaching each other. And some of those ideas I tried to share in a book called Wild Ideas, this idea that other species are active agents, um, I find is a very hopeful idea for children, especially because sometimes they have the feeling that it's all up to them. And when you let them know that it isn't just them, it's their whole communities that care about these things and other species too are active agents, it can have a great impact on their, on their feeling that things are possible. 
I think also this idea that life is far more resilient than we might expect. And something I often do with students is I ask them to seek out what happens after the worst. Because often, again, in our environmental reporting, we hear about a massive oil spill or we hear about a nuclear accident, and then we don't hear much about it afterwards. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. I don't know if any of you have been lucky enough to ever go here. I, I did, in fact, go diving here. You might recognize it more as this place. So this is Bikini Reef now. And this is how it looked when the um, nuclear explosion tests were done on it. And in fact, Bikini Reef now, some of the corals are back to the size of dinner plates. Um, we see 85% recovery of some of the corals in the areas. Uh, it's a pretty amazing story. Same is true as these wolves. These wolves are from Chernobyl. And in fact, the wolves who currently live in Chernobyl have the highest reproductive success of any wolves in Europe. Um, and I think where this leads us as educators is trying to increase our comfort level talking about ambiguity. Because it's true that both Bikini and Chernobyl are still nuclear areas, and there is still huge issues of, of nuclear fallout. And at the same time, they're incredible stories of recovery. And so our, our capacity to move beyond something is wrecked or something is perfect, I think is important when we're talking about resiliency and how do we deal with issues of ambiguity. I think another thing to really keep in mind is how do we challenge this human nature divide? You know, this great chain of being where we were at the top and everyone else was below us. Um, I've tried to do that through some of my work as an author. Uh, this is from a book called You Are Stardust, Every Breath You, sorry, I've got my thing covered, but it's the idea that when you blow a kiss to the world, you spread pollen that might grow to be a plant, that you as a human are actually an active part of pollination. Um, I was lucky enough to have the folks at OISE in uh, Toronto do teacher's guides. And I think, again, that, that idea of we, how do we co-create, working with educators to, and authors to share their work, I think is important. And in this case, I was just at the Adelaide Writers' Festival, another tremendous chance to talk about hope in the environment. And this young girl was putting together um, examples of Australian animal conservation successes to, to make a diorama. When we're thinking about losing that human nature divide, there's just such interesting cases coming forward. Whales, especially where in recent years, we've known a lot more about their culture. Uh, we know that killer whales in different parts of the world uh, have different cultures. We know that now too of humpback whales. And in this case, work by um, Whitehead, where we know that orcas are the first non-humans whose evolution, their genetic evolution, has now been driven by their cultural difference. Many of you will have been following the exciting uh, research coming out about trees and how mother trees uh, share their resources, their chemical resources through their fungal root networks and they'll actively direct when they're dying their resources to related members of, of, of their species and to the broader forest community. Um, sea otters I mentioned, uh, not, oh, sorry, did my, did my screen just change there on you? There we are. There you go. Um, so we have the, the, the whole idea of archaeology. We can now look at the archaeology of sea otter use uh, because we know sea otters have been using tools for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, emotional research is not just coming out of work with people. Researchers now, as reported in New Scientists, have been looking at happiness and bees, optimism and starlings. We know that fish have feelings. Recent work done on self-recognition and manta rays. What we know about manta rays is that they are able to recognize themselves in the mirror, just as it's a study that uh, scientists have used for many years to say, can you tell that what you're looking at is you? You know, if your dog looks in the mirror, um, they tell us the dog sees another dog. But if a chimp looks in the mirror, it's like you looking in the mirror. You know, you know it's yourself. And apparently manta rays can do that too. I'm just working right now on an article for uh, Hawkeye magazine based on this scientific research, which is that uh, humpback whales appear to be able to um, demonstrate altruism or compassion. 
And what they did was they looked across 140 different episodes of humpbacks intervening between, as you can see, the animal in the back there is a killer whale, transient killer whale, meat-eating killer whale, and the and humpbacks intervening in order to um, protect another species. And so in this case, this seal that you see on the iceberg in, in the images that follow, that seal ends up on the on cradled in between the flipper and the in the stomach of that humpback whale so this interspecies altruism is something we couldn't even i think imagine let alone study and now scientists this came out of the marine mammal science research journal just in 2016. so where that takes me um, this is a photograph it's uh, taken by a, a artist called mr tolly dano and Mr. Tolly Dano is a portrait photographer, and he likes to take portraits of people in different activities. And this particular one is of a gamer. So this is an online gamer, and the face he is making is a face that he made because he had just had an epic win. And according to gamers, an epic win is a win that is so big, you didn't even know it was possible. You know, it's beyond your expectations. You didn't know you could win that big in the game. And, and I like to think really big. I, I have to say that before we had our hashtag ocean optimism, um, I had gone to a, a, a talk. I was giving a talk at the International Aquarium Congress. And I told people at that Congress, it was zoo, it was zoo and aquarium directors from all over the world, that I really wanted to create a global torrent of hope. And I didn't know how to do that, but I wanted to do that. And when I made that request, I said, I'd love people to help me with that. Heather Coldaway from the Zoological Society of London walked up to me afterwards and she said, I can help you do that. And that's how we ended up meeting in small groups on my porch in Monterey and then, and then in London and then doing the hashtag and now these summits and now, you know, having John Kerry talk about hope. I think that when we dream big and we look for epic wins, we have a better chance of reaching them. So that's why I like to Think about Mr. Tolly Dano and this face. And to think about what is my epic win. And, and really for me, it's for us, all of you who are on this um, webinar with me, to think about spreading this global epidemic of wild contagious hope. Because we know hope is contagious. Because we know that when we spread it, it spreads to others and they spread it to others. We know from research that hope is a self-fulfilling prophecy, just as unfortunately hopelessness is. And so that's my epic win, and that's why I'd like to in invite you to help me with that. And with that, I think I'm going to stop and, and see if there are questions or if we can follow some of what if the conversation has come up on the chat line. Thank you so much, Ellen. That was fantastic. We did have a couple of people say, I really want to get a copy of this because I couldn't write, write it down fast enough. <laughs> that's fine. I'm happy to share it. No, no. worries. So we, we, we did record this, everyone, and we will post it. And some of the comments that from the questions is that there are a lot of folks on this webinar that are already celebrating the good, looking at what people can actually do, focusing on the positive from now you could fish in the Hudson to really helping young people see the hope. Um, but if you have an actual question, please type it into the chat room so that Ellen can address it. And, and I had a question, Ellen, is there research that shows that by switching, if you think about like an environmental education program to a more hopeful approach, that you actually see different outcomes in terms of either um, behavior change, conservation on the ground, or actually just in terms of people being more passionate and willing to take action? Is there actual research that shows that? Yeah, it's such a good question. And, and I would say that um, originally when I started talking about hope a lot, uh, and, and still to this day, a lot of times I think people are concerned that if we talk about hope, we might be somehow um, engendering complacency. You know, that if people think there isn't a problem, then that, that somehow we're saying that there isn't a problem. And then that is in no way true. And I, and I will say it's been fascinating when I do radio call-in shows and things like that that the more I talk about hope, the more people phone in and tell me about problems. It's, it's as if they think I don't know there's a problem. And so I think it's very complicated. I guess that's the answer I would give you, Judy, is that, that 
in no way when we talk about hope are we saying that there aren't massive problems, you know, and urgent problems. But what we do know from research is that when you feel that you are engaged in something that other people also care about and that you are part of, of a bigger thing, and I think we see it in movements, like I would say the gay pride movement, for example, um, that when you feel that you are part of something and that that bigger thing is having success, you, it, they do know from research that you are much more likely to stay engaged with it longer because you're being reinforced with the sense of accomplishment, that, that what you're doing matters. And that when you are doing something as an individual and you think you're the only one who cares about it and that, you know, it's too big for you, um, we do know from that apathy work that people tend to give up. Well, and I and think that... oddly about themselves, you know, they, they, they feel ashamed. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And for those of you who are out marching, whether it's the science march or the climate change march, where yes, people yes. together are talking about what we can do, and they're with other people who think about it, um, in a way, it, it can get pretty overwhelming. We have a question from um, Sharon who said, um, could you suggest language prompts that will bring out a more positive response than the usual surveys? Oh, that's such a good question. Yeah, you know what I think it, it mostly is, and it's it's interesting. I, I I would say, you know, I just it was interesting because I was just involved in the Earth Optimism Summit, and I came back and I was so excited about, um, you know, you may know work in appreciative inquiry. So that's a research yeah. approach where you're building off of of people's individual and collective successes and capabilities rather than a deficit model of what they're missing. You know, so I think if you look in the appreciative inquiry research literature, you'll see a lot of language and prompts that would, could be quite helpful for surveys. Um, but I came back and, and the local kids in my neighborhood had just been involved in Earth Day activities that were more, they were outside and engaged, but they were tracking um, a drop of probably an accidental spill of the pellets that uh, plastic is made from. And the kids were digging in the beach and finding them and they were doing that because they were uh, scientists in our local area were interested in where had these pieces of plastic ended up as a way of looking at ocean currents right so they were involved in current research they were involved in their local area they were outside you know these are all great qualities but but what was missing from their experience was they they were just looking for plastic in the ocean and they were finding tons of it and they felt lousy they felt really lousy and I thought, you know, this is a classic problem we have often as educators is how do we talk about that thing, which is there's a lot of plastic right there in a broader context that doesn't leave someone feeling hopeless, you know? So then I found myself saying things like that is true and that is a worry and how important it is to do that. But, but look at what is happening with this big sweep of, of awareness around ocean plastics. You know, and then I pulled out my uh, my map of the plastic bag bands that are sweeping. You know, they are happening all over the world and faster and faster. And so that sense of yes, this is a problem, and it, it does occur here. But there is a broad awareness that is moving directions in a big way. I think is the a, an important part for us to consider as educators. We, we also, Ellen, thank you for that, got a comment from John Anderson, who is part of the National Oh, Network. I know John. Well, yes. Hi, and, John. <laughs> and he, he just mentioned some of the positive work that's being done through the Noki campaign yes. and the work, the um, 100 Hopeful Days, um, and that everybody should check that out. I also wanted to just mention that our new community engagement guidelines, the guidelines for excellence, they're posted on the web. Um, thank you, Sai, for posting those. Um, and they have a section on appreciative inquiry if those, for those of you who are not familiar with that approach of looking at the positive and taking it from a positive approach. Okay. That's fantastic. I, I'm so glad that you added those in. And the thing I want to say is that, you know, even the, the emergence of hope, I would say that optimism and hope is, is becoming a movement, you know, in, in our environmental lives. And, you know, even a few years ago, if I were speaking, I had to struggle to find examples. I could make a good theoretical case from the literature and through research, but I had to struggle to find examples. And now I cannot keep up. I can, just as a movement should be, there are so many voices, 
so many campaigns, so many movements in this direction of recognizing how important it is that we, uh, that we salute good work and have more of it. And, and to answer your other question earlier, Judy, what we do know is that um, conservation success replication, which is really important to conservation managers, that that replication is more likely to happen when a, a study is showing what successes came out of it than when they talk about it as a common problem. Yeah. Right? So, we're, so that, that, in, that is one example where we can see that the focus on the replication of the, the success as the pitch is more likely to be replicated than a, a common problem as a pitch. And, and Ellen, we just had another question from Amy Schneider, which I think is a question that probably everyone on this call has, is how does one infuse a hopeful tone into environmental topics while also inspiring a sense of urgency about the realities of certain environmental and ecological situations? Uh, that's a beautiful question and such an important one. So what I would say is that, um, is that if, if you think about the, for many, many people, the environment has become synonymous with doom and gloom, even for young children. And when you ask children, how do you, so I would say one of the great ways to start is to ask children how they feel about the environment rather than what they know about the environment or what they think about the environment, ask them what they feel and to look for ways for them to express for how they feel. Because in my experience of asking kids that in a lot of places, I've discovered that pretty well everyone I've asked, whether they're kids or adults, feel something strongly. And once you know what they feel, then you can come from a place of compassion. You know, they feel worried, they feel hopeless, they feel uh, jaded, they feel cynical, they feel, they feel. And once you know that, then you can come at this direction of, you know, what do other people who feel the same way doing about this? How, how, where have successes happened? How might we build that within our community? Talking about our broader community caring too, you know, that it isn't just us alone or us alone in this class or us alone in this school. It's, it's people all over this community are doing this. Um, because what I find is people are very aware of environmental issues. That, that's, that's my starting place. And I haven't yet come across someone. They may not know the specificity of something, but they know there's problems. And they know those problems so much that they already are in a position of feeling like it's hopeless at a deep level, kind of a deep cynicism. And that our biggest challenge as environmental educators, I feel, is to be compassionate to that feeling and help them feel like there is a possibility by doing our homework of knowing what's happening in our community, knowing what's happening. And I think that's really, an, it's personally been a big change for me to see I have to do a lot more work to be up to date and specific because there'll be issues that I've known about for a long time that I think are just nothing's happening with them or, or I can't imagine a hopeful answer to them. But when I go looking for hopeful things, and I guess that's another thing is, is I myself looking for hopeful stories, find amazing examples of things that are happening and how ideas shift. So stories change. And I think we, we owe it to ourselves and the kids and adults we're dealing with um, to be sharing those stories as they're changing. Thank you. Um, we have another question and thanks to everyone like Tracy, Richie for, for sharing resources from Christine Lee and others. So we'll mm. also have all the resources that everyone are type that, that everyone is typing into the chat box. Um, but we had a question from Sharon, her problem area is having soil that was overwhelmed in a storm by the ocean. She's studying the minerals dispersed on the soil. Do you have any suggestions about seeing the positives so that she can better involve her community in the growth? Yeah, I guess I would look in, um, sorry, <laughs> I jumped in as if I have an answer. I, I, I recognize the complexity of these things so much. So I, I, I appreciate that and, and want to make sure that comes through. But I, I think it's interesting to look at, at other examples. Um, uh, I know that Heather, who's been working with uh, in the Philippines with communities involved in mangrove restoration and one of the things that has come out of that work, so again, a, a situation where something's been really affected by ocean waters leaching into the soil and how does that impact it, um, her 
community that she works with in the Philippines was hit by a devastating earthquake and a devastating tsunami in the same year. It was utterly horrible. And one of the things that they uh, were very aware of coming out of it is that the mangroves that they had been part of trying to restore were so devastated. And they thought those mangroves were just ruined, you know, wrecked. So they were clearing out the mangroves. But in those areas where they couldn't get to the mangroves to clear them out because there was so much other debris to deal with, what they realized is those mangroves were actually still alive. They looked dead. They looked wrecked. But nine months later, those that had been left in situ actually started leafing again. And so it, for me, that's an, a powerful story of, of the restorative ability of other species. And so I think in looking at it, Perhaps there's a way of saying, you know, what are we doing to deal with the soil issue, as you said, in your community? But what are the other species that are part of that ecosystem doing? And what do they, we know they do in other places? Thanks, Alan. We have another question from Lauren. Um, how do you inspire people to protect an endangered species when there realistically could be no hope for? She's working with African penguins and studies show they may be extinct quicker than people think within the next 15 years. It's a tough one. Yeah, it's a really tough one. I, you know, I was looking um, and speaking with people who work with terminally ill patients because I think we have a lot in the same way that I think we have to think about self care for ourselves by looking at hospice um, and how do hospice nurses uh, institutionalize care for themselves. I think there's a lot to be learned in in um, terminal ill work that people do with people who are terminally ill and. Hope has many different interpretations. If we look at the philosophy of hope and how different philosophers have talked about it or how psychologists talk about hope, what you start to realize is there's many definitions. And what I do know from um, work of people working with terminally ill is that hope in that case might take on the context of a meaningful present. You know, So often we think about hope as a better future, but others talk about hope in terms of a meaningful present. And I think when I think about hope as a meaningful present in a dire circumstance, it's, it's how is the work that we're doing today representing the values that we hold most dear, you know? And so that commitment to that species, because we care about it, we're, we are going to act because that is our value, you know? And then I think, it, I, it, I think it's very important that we have scientific models that show how urgent an issue is. But I, it's also useful to say this is a, this is a model. And it, it will change and move um, depending on what we all do and what happens in the world and what happens with other species and, and looking at other dire models that have shifted in much more positive directions, much faster than people anticipated. Thank you, Ellen. We have, um, maybe we'll take one last question here um, and then close out. Um, Kristen has a few words at the end as well. Um, Sarah asked what your favorite blog post um, is. Um, sorry, it just moved as soon as I said that. What's your favorite book, blog, blog or podcast this month? What do you read or listen to? Where do you regularly refuel your heart? Oh, that's such a nice question. Uh, so I'm madly addicted to podcasts and I, I just jump all over the place. I listen to a BBC podcast on podcasts. <laughs> um, so I follow those. I uh, to be honest, though, the, where I refuel is through hashtag ocean optimism, hashtag conservation optimism, hashtag earth optimism. I use those because they change every single day. And because I know they're being fueled by people all over the world, I, I've seen things on there I never expected. You know, um, like the example of, of, of shark um, conservation areas you know I'm lucky enough to be old and, and the older I've been you know to, to see issues that seem like they would never shift shift and do shift and then move quickly like I'd love it if anyone has a link or a, has a way I would like to make a series of very short uh, fast forward films that are you know maybe maybe 45 seconds in length that shows some of this, you know, the rapid escalation of marine protected areas, the rapid escalation of legislation to protect sharks, the rapid escalation of, of plastic bag bans, the rapid, because so often when we look, we, we look back, 
you know, um, nostalgically to a better past and erect future. And, and I just don't see the world that way anymore. And I don't see it that way anymore because of being fueled by constant updates on, on things that are working. Thank you so much. And uh, there is one more question. I don't want to leave it because it really is hard. So we have Melissa from Texas who said that she finds that most people are not even aware of environmental issues. So it's been challenging for her to educate young people about these issues without sharing photos of marine animals stuck in plastic or polar bears or all those. They simply don't know that environmental issues exist. How can I introduce them to these issues without too much gloom and doom? And that'll be our last one. Well, it's such, such a great question. And I, and I guess I would say, um, it, it, I would still come at it from the approach of how do you feel about the environment? Because if you come from that direction, you'll discover whether they, they are so disassociated from it, they think they have no feelings, or they, they do care a lot but think it's hopeless, or they think people are over-exaggerating what the problems are, or do you know what I mean? So if you come from that perspective of how do you feel, um, and, and maybe not, you know, depending on the age of the kids, so, you know, if you ask that to a middle school kid, that's a hard question, <laughs> you know, it's a hard way to do it. So you might use other assignments to do it. You might ask them to draw things and bring them in to share with just you, or, you know, there are ways of sensitively asking for people's uh, feelings. But I think that I would still start there because if we assume they don't know and don't care and we have to hit them with the hard stuff, uh, I just think there's so much research evidence that shows that leads to shutting down and tuning out and, 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 a, and a distancing of us and them. You know, I, I'm going to make you see something that's terrible. I think we want to come from that compassionate place of how do you feel? and then be open to whatever way they feel and from those feelings move into, yeah, some of these images are really troubling. And what are other people who do care about this doing and how do we be part of that? Ellen, thank you so much for this presentation and for just really focusing on the hope angle of everything that we do because we are bombarded by bad news. There's just no question about it. When you look at any trend on the environment, there are a lot of negatives. But by focusing on the hope, it gives us all hope. And uh, it's funny, I was, uh, I was giving a talk at, uh, at Stanford and at UC Davis, and I asked the kids, there were 30 kids, young people, these are grad students, yeah. um, how many of them were hopeful about the future? And there were about 30 in each class, and only three raised their hand in both classes. And yeah. that really just hit me that so many of our young people are not hopeful about the future, and especially with some of the administration um, initiatives about the environment right now, people are, are concerned, but they're also energized and the hope piece can really energize people. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think Judy, it's, it's, um, it's essential that we think about it in those terms because it isn't just a, wouldn't it be nice if people felt hopeful? I think it's a real crisis if people don't, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a really big deal that, so few of those students feel that way. And we're certainly, we were seeing declining enrollments in conservation science. That's what really drove Nancy Knowlton to jump, jump into this. Um, but I, I, I think what I would say in my closing remarks is that I, I, I like to think about narratives and how there are grand narratives that shape our lives. You know, And this grand narrative of doom and gloom is something we need to recognize as a narrative. It isn't a truth. It, it isn't that the world is all wrecked. It's, it's, it's that we have a story of doom and gloom. And in any movement, there should be multiple stories. Like if we think of the women's movement or the science march movement or whatever, the strongest, healthiest movements have multiple voices. They have multiple stories. There are some people talking about how bad it is for women. And there are other people celebrating the successes of women. You know, and I think we need to do exactly the same thing with the environment, that at the same time as we let people know that there are urgent and large issues that need our attention right now, we need many, many, many diverse voices talking about this uh, success that had happened with this species. The recovery of humpback whales to me is, is remarkable and made all the more remarkable in the Pacific Northwest 
because it's it's the whales themselves driving that recovery you know so i think that uh what i'm really advocating is a a diversity of voices of which many of them are focusing on the gains that are being made rather than a unified overwhelming doom and gloom narrative that leaves all of us feeling like there's no point Alan, thank you so much. And and by the way, NAAE would love to work with you on those fast forward positive stories. Brilliant, brilliant. We, we should talk because yes, we all need we those and you'll have to read these chats because everyone's saying, this is really what I needed because everybody is dealing with similar issues. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Kristen to close us out, but thanks so much. Thank you so much, Judy. And thank you everyone for, for being part of this today. This is a we, <laughs> you know, it really is a we, and I'm looking forward to now being able to look through the chats myself. Thank you. Great, thank you both to Ellen and to Judy. Um, we do have a lot of interest in, in um, this webinar, people would love to share it with their colleagues. There's been a lot of comments um, in the chat about that. So just for everyone's information, we will be posting a recording of Ellen's webinar on EE Pro as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, and we'll be emailing a link to the recording to anyone who registered for the webinar. So if you know of anyone who wasn't able to make it today, or if you would like to share this webinar with your colleagues, keep an eye out for that email. And just as a reminder, EE Pro is our one-stop shop for anything related to EE professional development. If you're interested in diving into more of the opportunities provided through EE Pro, you can join special interest groups. You can share resources, find events, opportunities, jobs, grants, and more. We also have discussion forums, and we'd love it if you would continue this discussion on hope in the EE Central group. Um, it would be great to, to keep this dialogue going and keep the hope, keep the hope alive. Um, all you need to do to join EE Pro is log in on NAAEE.org using your NAAEE credentials, and that will take you directly to your EE profile. Um, we will send instructions on how to do this in the follow-up email as well. So um, if I'm going too quickly, I promise you'll get it in writing. Um, just as a reminder to please stay tuned for future webinars in the series. Uh, usually we host them on the fourth Tuesday of every month, but this time our next webinar is just around the corner on Tuesday, May 9th at 4 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Uh, we'll provide a walkthrough and tips for using NAAEE's new guidelines for excellence in community engagement. So we hope to see you there. And just to reiterate, we have some great speakers coming up, including the webinar next week, as well as a talk on social movements from Dr. Hari Han from the University of California. Um, that will be on June 14th. We'd love to hear from you about what you'd like to learn in future webinars. So please let us know if you have ideas for future topics and presenters and stay tuned for details and to, loon, to learn more about future webinars. If you have a minute to take our quick five minute survey, we'd love to have your feedback on today's webinar and to hear about your ideas for future webinars. We will paste a link to get your short feedback via a survey. Sai has pasted that for us in the chat box. So we hope to hear from you and we hope to see you at future webinars. Thank you again for joining us. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Ellen. Yeah, and we'll talk more, Judy. I really appreciate that. That'd be wonderful to collaborate on that. Yeah, I would love it. Love it. Love it. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Have a hopeful day. Yeah, all of you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.